Alhamdulillah, we're continuing our discussion on Surah At-Tawbah. And it's, since it's been a, a few weeks, just to kind of give you a quick summary. So Surah At-Tawbah is the ninth Surah of the Holy Quran. And it's a Surah that begins essentially with a declaration of war against the polytheists who violated the terms of their peace treaty with the Holy Prophet. And in the following verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the mu'mineen, addresses the believers, and tries to motivate them to fight, to fight against those who have expelled the messenger, who have driven them out of their homes, who have violated this peace treaty. Because there was a number, of, there were a number of them who were reluctant to participate in jihad. So you see that throughout Surah at tawbah there are many ayat exhorting the believers to fight, to not be reluctant and not make excuses to participate in the battlefield. Now, in this vein, we find that Allah says in ayah number 23, where we left off, Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu la tattakhidhu aba'akum wa ikhwanakum awliya in istahabu al-kufra ala al-eeman wa man yatawallahum minkum fa'ulaika hum al-zalimoon. Allah says, O oh, you who believe, take not your fathers and your brothers as protectors if they prefer disbelief to belief. As for those among you who take them as protectors, it is they who are the wrongdoers. Now, brothers and sisters, it's important for us to understand that as the Muslim community was growing, as people are joining Islam, you have to bear in mind that there are many Muslims, many companions of the Prophet, who have family members, an extended family, who are still polytheists. So with the advent of Islam, there were many families that became very divided. In one household, you might have someone who's a believer, someone who's Muslim, and then you might have siblings and parents and children, uncles, extended family, who have remained on the tradition of polytheism. So many of the companions of the Prophet, they actually have direct family and extended family who are mushrikeen. And this is why one of the this is one of the reasons why many of the Sahaba were reluctant to participate in jihad. Because when you go to the battlefield, you're not fighting against strangers. In many cases, you're fighting against brothers. You're fighting against uncles, against fathers, against cousins. So the Quran here highlights that one of the reasons why there is this reluctance in the heart of some of the Sahaba is because they have family members who are mushrikeen. And therefore, going to the battlefield essentially means that they're going to be fighting against family members. So Allah says, O you who believe, لا تتخذوا آباءكم وإخوانكم أولياء Don't consider your fathers and your brothers as أولياء, as your guardians, as your protectors. If they prefer disbelief to belief. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds the mu'mineen that yes, they are your biological family. These are these might even be your biological parents, but you should not consider them your awliya. You should respect them. You should maintain ties with them, but do not consider them individuals who have your best interest in mind, because the reality is they themselves are misguided. Now, if you look at the Quran, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in Surah Luqman. Ayah number 15. He gives us worst case scenario when it comes to how, how we should treat our parents. You know, many people ask, I have parents who are not religious. How should I behave with them? I have parents who are, who are encouraging me to commit sin. How should I deal with them? 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 15 of Surah Luqman, وَإِنْ جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَىٰ أَنْ تُشْرِكَ بِي مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ So Allah is giving us the following scenario. You have parents, you have a mother and a father. Not only are they not religious, they're not even Muslims. You know, sometimes we have difficulty treating our Muslim parents with respect. Allah here says, if your parents pressure you, in jahadak. So not only are they pressuring you, they're striving, they're putting all of their energy to make you commit the greatest sin. in jahadak ala and So this is the scenario. You have two non-Muslim parents who are pressuring you and who are striving and exhausting all of their resources for you to do what? To commit shirk, which is the greatest sin. How should you, how should you respond? فَلَا تُطَعْهُمَا You don't obey them. You don't obey them. But the ayah doesn't stop there. Allah doesn't say just don't obey them and turn your face and sever ties with them. Allah says, فَلَا تُطَعْهُمَا وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا Allah says don't listen to them. But even when you disobey them, do it respectfully. So Allah says, even these non-Muslim parents who are exhorting you to commit shirk, they're doing mujahada. You know, from the word jihad, they're really struggling to make you commit this heinous crime. Allah says, don't obey them, but do musahaba. Treat them like companions. Meaning, don't sever ties with them. Be with them. Visit them. Maintain a relationship with them. وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا Treat them as companions in this life. So Islam teaches us that we should even be kind to non-Muslim family members. But the moment these non-Muslim family members become combatant, and they are willing to fight against the Messenger of Allah and the Muslim community in the battlefield, you have a right as a Muslim to defend yourself, even if it means that you have to fight against your own family. But under normal circumstances, you're to treat them with respect. You don't obey them. You maintain ties with them. But the moment they escalate the hostility to military conflict, you have to rise to the occasion. You cannot say, oh, they're my parents. I cannot, I cannot fight. My father is on the other side. Yes, your father is non-Muslim. Even if he is pressuring you to commit shirk, don't obey him. Maintain a relationship with him. But now that it's now escalating to a military conflict, Allah says, do not use the excuse that these are my awliya, these are my guardians, these are my family members. Allah says, since they are coming to the battlefield, you have to also rise to the occasion. Now, when it comes to Muslim and non-Muslim relations, there are some of us who have this misconception that we shouldn't have any type of relationship with non-Muslims, that we should become insular, we should isolate ourselves, that it's, it's, it's haram to have relationships with non-Muslims. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah 60, ayah number 8, He says, لَا يَنْهَاكُمُ اللَّهُ عَنِ الَّذِينَ لَمْ يُقَاتِلُوكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ وَلَمْ يُخْرِجُوكُمْ مِنْ دِيَارِكُمْ أَنْ تَبَرُّوهُمْ وَتُقْصِطُوا إِلَيْهِمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُقْصِطِينَ Allah says, God does not forbid you with regard to those who did not fight you on account of religion and did not expel you from your homes, from treating them righteously and being just towards them. We have no issues with, with non-Muslims. Even if they're atheists, whatever religious tradition they follow, Allah says there's no problem in having friends, having non-Muslim friends. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He doesn't want us to have non-Muslims as our awliya, 
as our intimate friends, where we share our innermost secrets with them, where we have a very, very close bond with them. This should be reserved for mu'mineen, but you should be friendly with non-Muslims. You should be friendly with all people. You should be just and righteous towards them. Who does Allah forbid you from having a relationship with? Allah says in ayah number 9 of surah 60, إِنَّمَا يَنْحَاكُمُ اللَّهِ عَنِ الَّذِينَ قَاتَلُوكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ وَأَخْرَجُوكُمْ مِنْ دِيَارِكُمْ وَظَاهَرُوا عَلَىٰ إِخْرَاجِكُمْ أَنْ تَوَلُّوهُمْ وَمَنْ يَتَوَلَّهُمْ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الظَّالِمُونَ Allah says, God only forbids you from forging friendships with regard to those who fought you on account of religion and expelled you from your homes and supported your expulsion. So even if they didn't directly do it, they are supporting your enemies. Allah forbids you from befriending these types of people. Whosoever befriends them, they are among the wrongdoers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you look at ayah number 23 and you look at these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the mu'mineen who are able to discern between their enemies and those who are not their enemies. You know, sometimes there are some very closed-minded Muslims. They have a very binary view of the world. The world is either Muslim or kafir. You're either my friend or my enemy. It's, it's a very binary way of looking at the world. Allah says, you have, you have every right to befriend. There's no problem in befriending non-Muslims, treating them well, treating them with respect and dignity. The only class of people that you are not permitted to befriend are those who are fighting you. And it's, very, it's, it's a very rational approach. Those who are fighting you, those who are driving you out of your homes, and those who are supporting your enemies. Do not forge alliances with them, even if they happen to be family members. Do not be foolish. Allah is telling the mu'mineen, don't be naive. Don't say that this is my father, this is my brother. Your father and your brother is fighting against Rasulullah in the battlefield. How can you, how can you have an intimate relationship with them? How can you befriend them? You, you, you maintain ties with them, but you don't share your innermost secrets with them you don't divulge things that are happening in the muslim community because they harbor malice towards the the muslim community and then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 24 now before we go on to ayah number 24 in ayah number 23 fathers and brothers are specifically mentioned allah says yeah amanu la aba'akum wa ikhwanakum awliya and you may ask, why only fathers and brothers? Why not sisters, mothers, cousins? It's because in Arabian society, the father and the brother had great influence over other members of the family. So in many cases, some, some of the Muslims who converted to Islam in Mecca and they wanted to go on hijrah with the Prophet, what happened? The, the, the mushrik father, the mushrik brother says to the, their sibling or their son that why are you going to go with Muhammad? Stay here with your family. So they abandon the messenger. Rasulullah, when he's in his time of need, they, they listen to their family members, meaning they refuse to join the Prophet. They failed to support the Messenger of Allah because of familial ties. Allah says, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi has more authority over you than even your father, than even your family members. Now, in ayah number 24, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes into more detail. So the first, ayah number 23, Allah's beginning a discussion about the possible excuses that are being used by the companions to excuse themselves from participating in jihad. Then Allah says in ayah number 24, he gives more detail. 
قل إن كان آباؤكم وأبناؤكم وإخوانكم وأزواجكم وعشيرتكم وأموال اقترفتموها وتجارة تخشون كسادها ومساكن ترضونها أحب إليكم من الله ورسوله وجهاد في سبيله فتربصوا حتى يأتي الله بأمره والله لا يهدي القوم الفاسقين الله says say if your fathers your children your brothers your spouses your tribe the wealth you have acquired commerce whose stagnation you fear and dwellings you find pleasing are more beloved to you than God and his messenger and striving in his way then wait till God comes with his command and God guides not the sinful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here gives us a long list of the things which might deter the believers from joining the Prophet in battle Allah mentions fathers parents basically children brothers, spouses, tribe, wealth, commerce, dwellings, all of these things are used as excuses. We mention fathers and brothers, wives, spouses. When some of the companions wanted to go to the battlefield, some of the wives of the Sahaba, what would they say? You're going to go and you're going to make me a widow? You're going to leave me with orphans? Tribes would try to prevent their own tribesmen from participating in battle, especially if they were non-Muslim tribes. They would say that, listen, if you support Muhammad, then we withdraw our support from you. You're on your own. You have to be loyal to your tribe because your tribe is your, ins is your insurance policy in Arabia. If you go against the will of the tribe, you essentially forfeit your your safety net, your security. As I mentioned in our previous lessons, participating in jihad was not just a risk to your life, it was also a financial risk. Because Rasulullah was not providing weapons for his soldiers or horses. Those who wanted to go and fight in jihad, they had to make a financial sacrifice. They would have to purchase armor, purchase weapons. In some cases, they'd have to pur purchase horses. And then Allah says, وَتِجَارَةٌ تَخْشَوْنَ كَسَادَهَا Commerce whose stagnation you fear. Inshallah, we'll come to see in the, 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 the verses that will come later on in the surah that Allah issues a declaration that the mushrikeen are no longer allowed to enter Mecca. Some of the companions, some of the Muslims were unhappy about this. Why? Because they have businesses in Mecca. When you say that mushrikeen and kuffar are no longer allowed to enter Mecca, in their eyes, what do they see? They see that they're losing customers. So some of the companions, when, the, when Rasulullah, when the ayah was revealed that the, the polytheists are impure and they're not permitted to enter Mecca, some of them were unhappy. They were unhappy about this. They said that we're, this is going to cause us a lot of stagnation in our business. We're going to lose half of our customer base, three-fourths of our customer base. So Allah says, if commerce whose stagnation you fear, and dwellings you find pleasing. Some of the companions didn't want to leave and go to the battlefield. They were afraid that in their absence, maybe their homes would be attacked, that there would, you know, the, the polytheists may damage their homes. So all of these things are mentioned. And subhanAllah, you see, brothers and sisters, that this, these excuses repeat themselves in every generation. If you look at 
the revolution of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. If you look at Kufa, this ayah, believe me, brothers and sisters, it is one of it applies to the people of Kufa, to many of them during the time of Imam al Hussein. How many fathers told their sons, you know, don't join Imam al Hussein, you're gonna get killed, it's too dangerous. How many wives grabbed their husbands and convinced them not to go? How many individuals decided not to join Imam al Hussein because they didn't want to leave their children as orphans? So these excuses were made during the time of the Prophet. They were made during the time of Amir al Mu'mineen. They were made during the time of Imam al Hussein. And even with the Zuhur of the 12th Imam, these same excuses will be made to the 12th Imam. My father, my brother, my business, my children. Allah says these excuses were made before and history has a tendency to repeat itself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah, what does he say? فَتَرَبَّصُوا حَتَّى يَأْتِيَ اللَّهُ بِأَمْرِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says after listing all of these reasons that some of the companions may give as an excuse to not participate in the battlefield. Allah says, then wait, then wait till God comes with his command. Now this sounds like a threat that is made, being made. And there's a discussion among the Mufassireen as to what is meant by this command. What is the meaning of Hatta yati Allahu bi amri? What is the coming of this command? What is it referring to? There are different opinions. Some of them say that this refers to the conquest of Mecca. But again, this is a very weak opinion because this sort of was revealed after the conquest of, of Mecca. Some have said that this refers to the idea that no, Allah will make business thrive in Mecca, even though mushrikeen are prevented, from, they're barred from entering Mecca. But again, it doesn't really carry that much weight. What makes the most sense and what seems to be the more plausible view is that the meaning of wait till the command of God comes, it means wait until Allah gives victory to the believers. Meaning those who are not willing to participate, don't worry because Allah says, I'm going to give victory to Rasulullah and those who are with him irrespective of your participation, meaning you're going to miss out on the glory of fighting side by side with Rasulullah and achieving victory. Don't think you're doing Rasulullah a favor. Rasulullah should not have to beg you to come to the battlefield. You are securing eternal honor by being with the Messenger of Allah. And this is why even if you look at Surat Al-Ma'idah, Verse number 54, there is a similar concept where Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, O you who believe, man yartad minkum an deenin, whoever apostates, whoever leaves Islam, fasawfayati Allahu bi qawmin yuhibbuhum wa yuhibbuna. Allah is saying that if you decide to leave Islam, you apostate, Allah says you're not hurting, you're not hurting God, nor are you hurting the Messenger. You will be replaced with people who love God and who are beloved to God. So Allah is telling the, these companions that if you're reluctant, if you're unwilling to join the Prophet, wait for the command of God to come, meaning victory will, will take place, whether you support the Messenger or you stay behind. So Allah is basically saying that Victory is imminent. It will happen. The question is, are you going to be part of the victory? Are you going to earn the honor of fighting alongside the Messenger of Allah and, and gaining the victory?